Good evening and welcome to Sitar Arts Center's uh, Salon Dialogue this evening focused on arts and education. We are, um, this is our sixth in a series of Salon Dialogues starting back in 2019 and put on by the Leadership Council. We are um, fortunate that virtual gives us the opportunity to continue these conversations and um, I welcome you all and thank you for joining us. Uh, the Arts and Humanities, um, I'm sorry, we are joined this afternoon and we will make an introduction of the people who will be joining us very shortly, but I wanted to start the conversation off just talking about my own personal experience where arts and education is concerned. You know, there were a lot of positive influences in my life that I still see and recognize today as a result of arts and education that I received in my formative years. But you know, what stands out to me the most are the stories that I'm able to access through social media about people's um, experiences and the influence that arts and education has had for other people. So for example, there is a woman who is um, suffering from Alzheimer's and she is given some uh, swan, music from Swan Lake. She has no recall of her past life. She's not really connected to the world today, but the moment she hears the music from her wheelchair, she begins to do all the movements and she remembers everything about that time so many decades ago. And it's very moving. I think on YouTube, there were like 13 million views. I know it's on other platforms as well. And everyone's response and comments are about how emotional it made them feel. I think because we can all connect to how the arts have influenced us today and how it can move us in ways and bring us back to those good feelings that we had in the past. So I welcome you all to, in the chat, uh, share some of your experiences, whether it's um, something that you've witnessed and maybe a link you could share that we all might be able to share in that experience, um, some personal experiences that you had growing up and the influence that it had on you, or witnessing that growth in someone else. Love to hear from others. So, um, and in the interim, I also wanted to talk about our format tonight. So, we will have a 30-minute conversation exploring key themes, and then we'll dig into, um, and that will be with the panelists, and then we will dig, dig into Q&A. And unlike in the chat where you're making your um, uh, sharing stories, hopefully with us now, we will um, ask that you um, insert your questions as we're speaking in the Q&A box instead of the chat. And then we will address those um, at the bottom half of the, or the, the last portion of the conversation. I think, and what I also wanted to share was just kind of like, what are some of the thoughts that came to mind as I'm preparing to start and, and um, engage with you all today? And arts education to me is not a luxury, but an important teaching tool. It helps unlock hidden talents, uncovers new passions, inspires bold, bold thinking, unleashes creativity, is an investment in the potential of a child. It stays with us forever. And I love this. I read this or I saw a video on this where someone said, it is the oxygen that makes all other subjects breathe. So uh, the next we would like to do, I would like to, before we get into the dialogue, is introdu introduce Loretta Thomas. Loretta has been with Sitar Arts Center for 14 years. She serves as our Chief Programs Officer. She'll tell us a little bit more about Sitar Arts Center. Welcome, Loretta. Thank you, Karen. <laughs> And my name is uh, Loretta Thompson. I'm the Chief Programs Officer at the Tart Center. I'm uh, really excited about this conversation. Arts education is uh, really important to me. Uh, I've been working with the Tart for so long and worked with children for a really long time. Um, if you have never been to the Tart Center, you should come by and uh, schedule a visit to come by. We are in the wonderfully diverse neighborhood of Adams Morgan in Washington, D.C. 
Uh, we were founded in 2000, the year 2000, and had a beautifully artistic home for children and youth uh, for all ages through, uh, through young adulthood. And we, last year, we celebrated our 20th anniversary. Um, families come from every ward of the city to connect, create, and contribute. Uh, their learning and skill building in the performing arts, digital and visual arts, uh, and dance. Uh, our vision at the TAR is that every child is able to discover their intrinsic, intrinsic gifts and that they have educational opportunities needed to transform these gifts into passion and purpose. Our staff work to confront the, the historic and systemic barriers that prevent from these our young people from accessing opportunities. And Sitar has a commitment that 80% of our students come from households uh, earning 60% or less of an area median income. So at Sitar, we build a, a loving community of teaching artists, staff, volunteers, and volunteers for our students and their families. And uh, we engage them every year through events and activities um, that the whole, the whole household and the community can, can engage in. At Sitar, our students discover who they are and grow into engaged, change-advocating, competent adults. Um, during the pandemic, we had to change a little bit. Sitar's community especially looked to the arts as a source of healing. They looked to Sitar for continued learning and belonging and engagement. Um, since the shutdown uh, in March 2020, Sitar has run hundreds of online classes and private lessons and continued our daily aftercare program. Uh, we've also added therapeutic art programs uh, to our offerings for children, teens, and parents, and, and professional development for our faculty. And this summer, we were able to uh, return to, safely return to in-person summer camp programming for our young people and for our early childhood students. Camp Sitar helped to ensure students had that social emotional foundation needed for uh, active participation and learning in DC uh, and prepared them for a full return to in-person schooling this fall. And today is uh, actually the beginning of our fall in-person semester for our, uh, starting with our daily arts aftercare program um, and our arts after school program starts on Monday, October 4th. Our students are practicing social distancing and same student cohorts um, to keep our community healthy. As the TAR returned to ask our students, parents, faculty, and staff to explain why community matters, why the arts and creative expression matter, and why community-based programs like the TAR are essential to our nation's recovery following the COVID-19 pandemic. We want to share their answers with you in this brief video. So please enjoy a homecoming for our community. It's awesome to be able to have you guys be here still and be able to take my child, especially in the summertime when obviously there's no school. So the places around here are limited as to where you can take them unless they're out further out in the suburbs or stuff like that. So yeah, it's great. I honestly like felt like crying yesterday when I dropped him off because Paulo was really excited to come back. Um, he's been, you know, isolated for a while with the quarantining and all that, and just staying away from people, but he's ready to be around um, kids and have fun in person. So I'm really, really grateful. I think after almost a year and a half of people being indoors and um, with limited contact with their community members and uh, people outside of their families, they really need this, especially young people. I feel like young people need the, that socialization, need their friends, need to have new experiences, and that's been missing for a year to have. Sitar is a really good camp. It inspires me like art. I literally make so much good things. It's like at home. I don't even have an art studio. This is like an art room. My favorite part of the first day is that I got to go to aftercare, and I can't wait to go today. And I've met a lot of new people that I really like, and there's a lot of new cool stuff to do. They were bonding, and they were playing along with each other. Um, and you can tell that after a summer, you know, being at home and virtual and then coming in person, 
you could see that they were just unleashing all that energy. When we went to Meridian Hill Park, they were all playing, you know, all sorts of things with balls, with jump rope, and with one another. And it was just great to see them running around and laughing and just having fun and enjoying themselves. I like Mr. Jonathan because we always do fun things like mousetrap, dragon's tail, dodgeball, and many other things. What's another word for blue? Uh, a sword. Uh, and actually, I think I might have. I just hope that they just enjoy some of the uh, uh, some of the things that you can do with the photographic arts, whether it's doing it in the dark or what we're calling the dim room for summer camp or whether it's uh, with the uh, uh, cutting edge technology that we're working with in the computer lab. I'm very happy and she's very happy too because uh, last school year she stayed at home online school and uh, last summer also she did the camp sitter online and uh, she really needed this. The kids can uh, be together and it's mean a lot. I'm looking forward to my kids bringing home knowledge that I couldn't provide them with. Learning new skills from artists who have abilities and talent that I don't possess and learning from other adults, learning from other young people that they're their age, hanging out with their peers. That's really what I want to see. What are some of the things that you get out of being a part of the community? What are some of the benefits? I've been coming to guitar since I was five months old, and now I'm almost 13. And the reason why I came back to Camp Sitar is because it's so fun coming in, and it brings back memories since I was little. I think a lot of us, especially the kids, have struggled, and they have been impacted um, just as much, if not more, than uh, adults have. Um, and we probably won't understand how it's impacted them until they get older and can really express it. Um, so they can take this experience to to use the arts as a way as of expressing how they've been feeling um, and how they want to see things. I hope she grows uh, uh, for to be a better person, better child, interact, be able to open up a little more and have that communication with other children as well as other adults where she's more comfortable. And I think uh, this place does it. I'm hopeful that Sitar can be that bridge to going back to school in person, but in an environment where they have a lot of input to their learning, where it's really about being who they are and discovering themselves through art. It's simply about thinking and creating and being together and having fun with their friends and feeling understood and understanding themselves. So welcome back. I don't know if early I mentioned that uh, my name is Karen Robinson Obebo. I work with ABC7 in addition to um, giving my time back to Sitar Arts Center. And I'm happy to have you all here today. I'd mentioned before about Q&A after we've had our discussion with the three panelists. So feel free to um, leave questions, comments in the Q&A. And if you want that question answered by a specific person, please indicate which of the panelists you'd like to answer that question. And so allow me to begin by introducing uh, our, our, our panelists. I'll start with Colby, Dr. Colby Tyson. She is um, a Hampton University grad. We share that in common. So that was an exciting thing to learn. Um, I also know um, that she did a lot. Of, she was very active when she was at Hampton, and then she moved to this area. She um, went on to uh, get to get her uh, get her medical degree from Georgetown, George Washington. My apologies. Um, and she did her fellowship program and residency at uh, New York Presbyterian Hospital slash Columbia University Irvington Medical Center. And so she has a plethora of knowledge and information that she will be able to share with us. And she's also board certified American uh, with the American Board of Psychiatry, Psychiatry and Neurology. 
Additionally, what I thought was very interesting to find out that, you know, the work that she does and what it requires of her to do that work didn't necessarily, wasn't necessarily the way she started. Um, she went through, um, she graduated from Blair High School and she was in their arts program and ended up transitioning to become a medical doctor, which to me seems connected, left and right brain. So we can talk about that a little bit more later, but um, I welcome you, Dr. Tyson. And then we also have Nancy Dougherty. Nancy comes from the National Endowment for the Arts. She is the um, arts education team lead and has been with the organization since 2000. Nancy says uh, she has worked with applicants in disciplines of dance, literature, theater, and musical theater. She also works with state arts agencies, arts education managers, helping design an annual professional development institute through the National Assembly of State Arts Agencies and serves on the advisory committee of the Arts Education Partnership. From 2004 through 2007, she managed the agency's summer school in the arts program, a national initiative designed to access, to access students' learning and offer potential models of rigorous standards, standard-based arts education. Prior to her federal service, she was an arts education coordinator for the West Virginia Commission on the Arts, where she managed the government's task force on arts and basic education. She serves as a facilitator, presenter, consultant, panelist, and conference planner for many state and national arts organizations. She attended Warren Wilson College and is a graduate of Western, West, West Virginia University. Welcome, Nancy. We also have Benz Marstone Duglio. Benz is, we're so excited to report, a sitar alum. Having started with sitar in the 2000s, in the early 2000s, at about the age of 12, I believe, he, um, um, so from there, it, at the age of 12, he was accepted into the Washington Conservatory of Music um, in the nation's capital here in, in Washington, DC. He was a member of the National Sympathy Orchestra Fellowship Program, also in DC, with a fellow, he, while a fellow, he uh, participated in master classes and performances at the John F. Kennedy School of the Performing Arts. Today, Benz is a professional cellist and cello teacher in the San Fernando Valley area and surrounding areas in California. He's a teach, he teaches, he's been teaching cello since 2015. He's committed to his students um, and ensuring that they achieve best potential, uh, that they achieve their best potential through weekly up, follow up and productive practice plan. Something I bet he learned through sitar, but we'll find out. He is also a freelance musician and a California State Northridge alumni. Biz is also a celloist at Cal State Northridge on the Honor String Quartet and Principal Cello at the University of the University Symphony. This is also a recipient of many scholarship awards and is uh, recognized by his school's music department for his outstanding cello performances and top symphony orchestra mu musician award. Thank you all for joining us today. Happy to have you. I'd like to start the conversation off with um, hearing some of your stories, whether it's something you've experienced personally, how you recognize art has um, continued to influence your life today, um, witnessing growth through someone who you were teaching and seeing their, their creative juices unfold in front of you. I'd love for each of you to share anything you feel would be um, a great story for the group. So why don't we start with Nancy? Thanks, Karen. Hi, everybody. It's it's great to be with you all tonight. Um, I'll just say that um, the arts have always been a part of my life. I grew up in a, a, a place uh, in an era when um, the arts were taken out of schools 
uh, for the most part, particularly in the elementary um, age. But my parents and family have always been interested in the arts and um, uh, helped make opportunities, and our community helped make opportunities that, that uh, my siblings and I could participate in. So, um, I, you know, I was in, in choir, I did a lot of theater, I took music, other music lessons, visual arts, um, our family, uh, particularly my mother's side of the family sang together all of the time when we go on, um, you know, go be together as a family in the summer. Um, I, the theater in particular was very important to me and, and I, uh, I haven't done theater in a while now, but um, participating on stage, backstage um, with every theater group uh, that my hometown had from Children's Theater to the Charleston Light Opera Guild and the stage company, all kinds of theater companies. And that's really where I felt the most at home and the most like, uh, you know, I was an accepted person, had a lot of fun um, and, and learned all kinds of things about myself and others. So I really feel like the arts, um, that, that, was, that was my big anchor. Um, as a child and still obviously is as an adult since that's what I've devoted my career to. So. And I'll just say one more quick story um, where, where I saw, you know, I saw something very important once a long time ago at a little, uh, you know, went to a, a, a junior high school that was doing a, an abbreviated version of Midsummer Night's Dream. And I overheard a teacher afterwards talking way too loudly um, about a student who was performing as the lion. And um, this, this girl that I mean, just in this eavesdroppy moment learned that this teacher really didn't think this, this student um, could do anything. I mean, she had a very, very negative opinion of the student, but when she saw her perform and just really become that role on stage, it changed her perception of that student. And it's just like, well, that's, that's why we're doing this. That was a very important moment um, for me. I bet that was a long time ago, but you will never forget. Never. Thank you. Thank you for sharing. Uh, uh, Kobe, would you like to go next? Oh, absolutely. Um, so I guess what I would like to talk a little bit about is that you know I think about arts and I think about what I do as a mental health professional so um, just a little more specifically I work on I'm an inpatient psychiatry attending so I work on an inpatient unit and working with kids you know in the midst of intense crises and so when I think about arts I think about it so much in terms of mental health kind of sustaining our mental health um, you know, optimizing our mental health and also recovering within our mental health. It's not just meds and therapy. It's also other components of a child's life that helps kind of keep them afloat. And so when we talk about the arts, I've seen the arts be used to help kids express themselves when they can't find the words. I've seen the arts be used to, you know, reenact or communicate things that are too scary to say and discuss. Mm -hmm. I've seen it as a way of there's some kids who live in lives that are out of their control and there's chaos and there's things going on that they don't have control over, but they find a peaceful place in, their, in the world of the arts where they do have some control, where they can kind of escape some of the, the, the more stressful elements of their lives in a healthy way. Um, arts, I've seen it as a meditative process and a mindfulness experience for some kids. Um, also as part of their mastery, right? You know, how does it feel when you, you find something you're good at, right? And how does that build on your self-esteem as a kid? Um, also just, if you just think about what does it take to do the arts? There's so many developmental milestones a kid gets, a youth gets, gets to meet by doing the arts, right? We're talking about the socialization aspects, communication, the focus, the discipline, motor skills. There's just so, it's just so much there that the arts help kids grow and learn whether they're in a mental health crisis or not. Um, I do think, I think as we spoke about earlier that it's not necessarily a luxury. It's, it's part of the education. It's part of a child's development. And it's, it's something I get to see every day. And so, you know, I'll talk a little bit more later about how I see it on our, on our unit in the hospital. Um, but I think if you think about it with our youth now, you know, you also don't know how it's gonna affect them when they get older and how it will come into play in their lives. And I think, you know, as we spoke about earlier, as a physician, when I was in high school, you know, I, my focus was in the communication arts program. And I think about what I do every day now, right? I talk to youth. I have to, you know, youth are not easy to 
please all the time. And sometimes you got to improvise and you got to work with them. It's no algorithm how to talk to it to a teen or to a child. And so I think about how I have to improvise every day. And I think about my theater arts class when I was younger. I think about how I have to view a kid's life through their lens, through their eyes right not just through my own so I think about to my days in the photography studio in high school so you just think about all these aspects of the arts that you never know how they're going to play out as you get older and so um, I'm excited to be on this panel and talk a little bit more about that and um, yes I'll bring any questions later on. Thank you so much and it reminds me that I didn't speak about the video that we just watched and the thing that stood out to me was the obvious joy of mm -hmm. all the children and all the things that they were readily speaking of. And sometimes children are, don't know exactly how they feel or how to express that. But in this instant, every ch child was readily able to express all the joys. And I felt that deeply from everyone that spoke as well as the parents who the mom said she was going to cry. And I completely felt her um, on that and the ability to put her, children, her, her child back in the environment at Sitar. And the parent, I love that the parent said, you know, I'm not an artist, so I want my kids to be with the pros and to be with their friends. So I just wanted to comment on that video because I thought it was pretty moving. So, um, and you kind of touched upon that. So thank you, Kobe. And um, so now Ben, please share. Hi, yeah, so Hi. thanks for having me today. As you already know, I'm a Sitar alum, and I currently live in Los Angeles. You know, and I basically I'm very glad to be here because I'll be sharing how powerful art can be to the shaping of who I am today. Um, so yeah, I was born in Peru. I came to the U.S. when I was eight years old, and I think it's important to point out that the first the first four years that I was in the U.S., I attended six different schools. So as you can probably already imagine, that's a lot for, it's very unsettling for someone so young to handle it at a young age, you know? Uh, but thankfully I had a supportive family, my Aunt Maria, my dad, and a very musical family, you know, to help me get through all that. But, you know, during that, those years of jumping from school to school, and obviously I was facing the language barrier because I did not speak English, uh, socializing was an issue, obviously, and hence making friends was an issue for me. So luckily, my Aunt Maria found the Sitar Art Center and signed me up for classes. I started learning cello, but, you know, Sitar Art Center was the kind of like a safe place where I felt comfortable, you know, for the first time, I have to say, um, expressing myself through, obviously, art and music, you know. It was the first place where I can interact with fellow students, fellow peers, and not even have to say anything. I, I, I didn't have to speak because I would just draw something, a butterfly or a flower. And, you know, I would get congratulated because of that. And I didn't have to say anything. I basically drew it. And or performances, recitals, you know, where you get to perform and you get applauded. And that was very rewarding to me. So which is one of the reasons why I think art, you know, what's that saying, um, can speak, um, art is, music can say what you can't say in, exactly. put in words, you know what I mean? Exactly. But yeah, and you know, at Sitar, obviously you get to meet so many great mentors, Rhonda, Joe, um, Sylvia Sweet, and, um, and my cello teacher, Nancy Snyder, you know, that really helped me to, Know, experiencing all these music, whether it's theater, art, painting, interaction that really, you know, helped me become a, more confident in myself, I guess. And language wasn't really an issue at Sitar Art Center. So that, that's, that's very important. You know, Sitar also opened the doors for me. Um, it prepared me to attend the Sphinx some, summer program in Boston. I obviously the National Symphony Orchestra Fellowship Program where I studied with David Tai. Um, I feel like I'm bragging, but no, no. <laughs> uh, the National Conservatory where I studied with Nancy and, and ultimately opened up the door to Duke Ellington High School of the Arts, which oh. is my high school. And, you know, and that was the first place. Yeah, I, I own it a lot to sitar, of course, but it was the first place where I was like, just free and prepared. I 
it was the first it was the first school where I went in feeling confident you know not having to wander about certain people or you know how to say something so it was the first place where I you know was able to let loose and be myself for sure you know and I made so many friendships there and I still talk to a lot of people that I went to school with so but yeah now today I find myself here in Los Angeles and it's kind of full circle moment for me you know because I graduated a year ago with a bachelor's degree from CSUN or Cal State Northridge and I'm working at a music school it's called the Mozart Music Academy and I'm not lying it's shaped so similar to the original Sitar Art Center it's like once you go in there's it's just so narrow and there's like six practice rooms on the right and just one big room on the left so it reminded me a lot about Sitar it's like oh I got to work here so you know it just feels great to work with kids and I'm also I was part of YOLA, the Youth Orchestra of Los Angeles, um, which is an affiliation with LA Phil. Um, and basically it does what sitar arts does to the youth, which is bring the arts and music to, you know, underserved communities. And that's very important to me. And I, so I'm glad to be in somewhat connected to that. And yeah, I'm preparing for grad school auditions now and studying with Ben Hong one of my idols, wow. so that feels great. He's a, he's a principal cellist at LA Phil. And I don't know if you've seen the Kobe Bryant um, memorial, but he was the cellist that played for his memorial. Wow. So I've yeah. never heard his name before. That's, that's absolutely amazing. And yeah. I've heard new things about you in just that short answer that you gave. One, <laughs> um, you may know, this is a whole side note, but I just have to say it. Do you know Phoenix Diggs? She was I think the same year as you, she's vocal. Anyway, mm -hmm. that's just a side note. But what I want to say about Duke Ellington is, and what I love about Duke Ellington is that you automatically feel exactly what you spoke to. And that is artists with artists. There's right. an understanding that transcends what would typically happen in a high school setting. And I think that is one of the most powerful things that happens to students that go there. So I'm excited yeah. to know that you had that exposure and had such a great experience yeah of course yeah right. and then and it, it does invite a next question which you kind of already spoke to and that was um with the work you're doing now and how it mirrors sitar arts center so as you approach those students and you you're feeling the 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 um the sitar energy um do you think you approach those students differently your interactions with them are uh, different because of your sitar experience? Are there things that you know that if you had not gone to sitar that um, um, those encounters might be different in some way? I think so because having gone to sitar, it has shaped the way I interact with kids, I think. In the sense that I can relate to them, especially if there are Latinos, if they are, whether it be they're gonna pursue music for the rest of their lives, I don't think that's the real point. The real point is that, you know, music helps you become just a better human being, you know, that's and right. better citizens. And so I do think sitar has helped with that. You know, the fact that I can approach students and kind of relate with them. I was like, I was in your shoes. I know what you're going through. And, you know, what did I, what did I, what was I missing back then that mm -hmm. I could provide to you that, you know, so yeah, it has helped with that. Thank you for sharing mm -hmm. that. I feel like I learned so much just now. <laughs> um, it does lead me to a question I have for you, Nancy, and that was about um, the um, what's what's the relationship between um, arts education, civic engagement, and academic success? Because I think this is a perfect um, alignment to the conversation I just had with Vince. It actually really is. And I would just say, see what they said, um, but I'll add to that. Um, so um, there are uh, a number of different studies, some that the Arts Endowment has uh, done themselves and some that another organization called the Arts Education Partnership um, has collected in a wonderful resource called Arts Ed Search on uh, the, on the partnerships website and the partnerships known as AEP. 
Um, if you look on their website uh, in arts ed search, there are 247 studies under the heading student achievement and success. And I'll give you some of the titles um, and I can, I can, I'll drop a link in the chat. I can't talk and drop links at the same time. I'm not, I'm not a teenager anymore. Um, so, um, so for example, um, the there's a title from July, 2021. Uh, it's a, it, the title is, it just made me want to do better for myself, performing arts education and academic performance for African-American male high school students. Another recent one in the face of uh, the unprecedented creative youth development guides, uh, organizations to adapt, support and thrive. And that one's directly related to how everybody had to all of a sudden change it up to keep going um, during uh, the, this global pandemic we're experiencing. Uh, there's another one called a vision of civically engaged arts education teens as arts-based researchers. I mean, so it just goes on and on and on touching on lots of topics related to youth and civic engagement. Um, several years ago, the Arts Endowment um, supported a study uh, that was led by the late Dr. James Catterall um, and it's called the Arts and Achievement in At-Risk Youth. Um, it, their findings from four longitudinal studies, three of them for, are from the US Department of Education. And this was the first time that these longitudinal studies were actually mined uh, for the data, the really critical data that's in them. And it supports things like better academic outcomes um, for children and youth. So, uh, children and youth who have a sustained uh, course of study in the arts um, tend to have, it's show, this report showed uh, better academic outcomes for them, higher career goals, um, being more civically engaged, you mentioned Karen, so um, higher volunteer rates as an adult, mm -hmm. um, a higher chance of um, reading a newspaper, I mean, things like that. Um, uh, voting in elections, uh, volunteering in the community, those sorts of things. So that's a really interesting and important study. And it's also, I'm not a researcher at all, and it's written in very clear language with great graphics. Now it is a few years old now, but I think you, know, you can get a lot out of it still. Um, and then, um, well, I'll just stop right there. We, we, there. There are so many different resources and I'm gonna drop some of the links in the chat that I've just mentioned so people can take a look on their own um, and see those. Thank you, I'd love to see that. I mean, that's a lot of articles and I'm sure there'll be tons of information many of us will enjoy receiving. So thank you for doing that. So uh, Colby, why don't you talk then about, um, you know, I was reading something that said that uh, a report on mental health showed over 30% of preteens to adolescents, there's a 30, more than a 30% increase in um, mental health needs of preteens to adolescents seven months into the pandemic. So um, I know that you are seeing obviously a lot of that. And I was wondering if you could um, speak to some of that and what are some of the signs maybe that parents can be looking for that might help them to identify when their child might need more than a pep talk? Yeah, I mean, that's a great question and I would love to speak a little bit more on that. So, you know, just also highlighting before the pandemic, um, we were already seeing an uptick in the mental health needs of our youth. We were seeing rises in the suicide rate of kids between the ages of 10 and 14. So I just wanted to point out that we were already in the midst of, you know, a crisis in our youth related to mental health and then this pandemic hit. And with the pandemic, you know, you're thinking these kids are, their, their whole developmental trajectory has just been thrown askew, right? Instead of, you know, getting time to start developing away from their parents, having more independence as teens, they're now at home with their parents 24 seven with different sets of expectations. You know, kids who were previously engaged in activities such as the arts are now kind of cut off from those activities because we were trying to find ways to do it in a safe way, um, in a socially distanced way, but it was really hard to do. So a lot of the pandemic really pushed a lot of kids either into isolation, heightened anxiety, disconnecting from the things that also 
kind of help them express themselves, but also help them to start forming their identity of who they were, who they are. So we definitely saw an uptick. The other thing that we saw was that the needs were actually more acute. So, you know, we've always seen crises on in the inpatient unit, but the kids who were coming to us were coming even more with even more severe symptoms than what we were seeing prior to the pandemic. So, you know, I say this to say that there were some kids because they just had a lot going on. So the symptoms were more severe, but then there were others where a lot of people were worried about getting them into the hospital sooner than later because of COVID and safety. So there were some early signs um, that might have been seen, but it was kind of like, do I bring the hospital or not? There was also a backlog in getting kids into outpatient care. Um, and so even when parents saw that there might be signs, you know, trying to get their child into care, it was just kind of the system was overwhelmed. And so, you know, I think the pandemic has highlighted that our kids need support. And mental health care can look in so many, can be seen in so many different ways. It can be medications, it can be therapy, it can be art therapy, it can be group therapy. Um, so there's lots of ways to think about it. So some of the things I tell parents to look for, especially in their kids, um, are withdrawal, right? So you're seeing your child kind of pulling away from the things that they usually would engage with, isolating themselves. You know, now some of this, if you're dealing with the teenagers, you know, are not atypical to say, right? You know, some teens at that point in time, it's normal for them to want to spend more time with their friends, maybe less time with their parents. Maybe they're not talking much about feelings with their parents. Some of that is typical, but there starts to be a shift when you start seeing that there's significant isolation even from peers, right? If you see that they're spending a lot of time just up in their room alone, like those are other signs that it's not typical of adolescents. That's kind of them pulling away. Um, you know, seeing kids lose interest in things that used to bring them joy. Now, sometimes they're growing out of something they used to be interested in and off to new interests, but sometimes that loss of interest is a sign that we're not getting joy or pleasure because we're looking at the world from a different lens, one that might be part of depression. Um, so that's something to look out for. You know, in adolescents and kids, depression can look very different. So they may not express sadness, but you might notice your kid becoming much more irritable and angry and more frustrated over things that usually wouldn't have bothered them. So irritability can be seen as an early warning sign as well. Um, poor self-care, so they're not taking care of themselves or hygiene. Avoidance of situations they usually probably would have been able to engage in, especially school avoidance, can start being an early warning sign of some, some anxiety that might be going on. Um, changes in sleep patterns, appetite. Um, other things that we look for are some kids, especially our younger ones, they might become clingier and more kind of anxious, especially during the time of COVID, we've seen that. I will also say that comments, if you hear your child starting to make comments about wanting to disappear or you know, wishing, you know, what if I weren't here, asking questions or just any comments related to suicide, you know, I think those are things to take very seriously and those can be early warning signs. Even if your child is like, oh, I would never do it, right? It's communicating that we're in some type of stress, distress that we're trying to figure out what to do. And I, I typically see suicidal thoughts and suicide attempts as a problem solved. It's like a solution to some problem a child has. And so hearing them talk about it means they're dealing with some problem that they're trying to figure out how do they solve. And if that's the only way they have, then that's worrisome. So we want to jump in and think about like, how do we help identify what is the problem they're dealing with? What are, what's overwhelming them? So, you know, sometimes I hear parents comment that, you know, they, my kids say they're suicidal in the setting of consequences. And I always say, regardless of that, they're communicating something to you, right? If it's, even if it's not that they're going to kill themselves, they're communicating either distress or frustration that they need some help in figuring out how to communicate that. So I would say those are some of the warning signs I would mention, I would I typically mention to parents. Um, and just sometimes as a parent, if you're your guts, like something's off with my kid, right? They yeah. seem a little different than, than usual. You know, I think that's a time to find time to talk with your child, right? I think a lot of times we're so overwhelmed with all of the things that we need to do to provide the basic needs for our youth that some of the needs that we overlook or not overlook, but maybe are not as highlighted is just sitting down and 
talking with them and hearing them and giving that space, even if they don't use it, but just giving them that space on a regular basis to be able to share if something is going on. Um, so that's usually some of the advice I give to parents and especially as we're transitioning back into school um, and back into a life um, for our youth. I think it's important for us to be checking in with them. How are they dealing with the transition? Are there things that are going well? What are the things that are worrying them? Where are they having struggles? Because you want to start hearing that now to help them learn how to navigate the world. Mm -hmm. And I would imagine as you were talking about if there's a moodiness with your child that may or may not be related to pandemic or depression at all, mm -hmm. that um, it's finding the right way to communicate and keep mm -hmm. their communication going with children. One of the things that I read about that I thought was pretty interesting and may be true of most people at any given time, and that was that it, um, the article was saying, if your child expressed some level of depression, don't try to fix it. Um, I, I forget exactly what was said, but it was basically like parents shouldn't try to talk their children out of depression. And I think, you know, children aren't going to come with, well, so I'm depressed because A, B, and C, so let's get it moving. No, they don't necessarily even know themselves. So um, I think in the, you know, we, we live in a life of just kind of a fast pace, even in the slowing down of the pandemic, but we may be reactive to our children in the routine ways that we are reactive and possibly miss something. Mm -hmm. So, um, yeah, I thought that was really kind of like, oh, wow something really that stands out about just really stopping to hear exactly what they're saying and not being dismissive. Yeah, and, and I think when I, I, I talk to parents about this all the time because you know what parent wants to see their child suffering with depression or it's not even just depression, but suffering with stress that they don't know how to manage, right? So the, the inclination is I wanna fix this for my kid. I wanna help them. If I just know what caused this, I can fix it. Yeah. And so it's, it's well-intentioned. But what can happen, I think the part that parents may not always be aware of is when a kid is suffering so much and they feel so deep down in a hole where they don't know how to fix it, and then here comes along these adults saying, oh, we can fix this. It almost invalidates their experience. Like, well, if it could be so easily fixed, why can't I figure it out? So then you start seeing kids feeling shameful of their emotions, feeling guilty about their emotions. Um, sometimes it does, it takes away the space to talk to the parent because they're like, well, I don't know if my parent can handle this because they're just trying to fix it. They don't, they, they can't talk to me about this. So sometimes we're inadvertently closing a door for a kid to talk to us about it or we're kind of inadvertently contributing to additional feelings of shame and guilt. And so what I say to parents, when your kid brings that up, I think acknowledging that maybe you don't, like, you know, I can't imagine how this may feel, or, you know, I understand, I could see how you could feel that way, tell me more. And having them talk to you about it because it allows them to number one, learn how to express themselves and models that you can handle it. Um, and it kind of opens up more doors in that way. And then after we've kind of validated, explored and understood, then we start trying to figure out, well, I wanna find a way to help. Like, what can we think of? How can we do this? Then start bringing in the advice um, at that point in time. But we have to do that first step. Right. You know, another thing, because we, you know, many children have started to go back to school, maybe it's an opportunity for parents to create a new routine, maybe that allows you to tap into what's happening with your children. Because um, I've heard that for some high school children, as much as they all really want to go back, and I'm hearing across the board how excited kids are to be back, um, they were going into it. I was hearing that some kids were having some anxiety about, you know, who's my friend group now, because their friend group situation has changed for some and they don't know where they're going to find their place. Um, and unlike at Duke Ellington, where children have an automatic program of networked, if you are a dancer, if you are in you know, music, um, the general public school doesn't naturally have groupings that will give you a place to fall back on when you go back. But I think the new, start of the new school year maybe is a good way to say, hey, every evening let's do A, B, or C that maybe give you a chance that they'll share with you in the beginning what's happening. I don't know, I'm just rambling at this point, but just thinking about, you know, all the children out there and what they may be facing. So I appreciate your expertise on this. Um, and so maybe I will transition to Ben's. I wanted to ask you about um, your field, uh, your profession. Do you think that if it were not for your aunt, your aunt finding sitar, 
but you'd be in a different place. I know you mentioned, I think I did understand that you have, um, um, there's a musical inclination within your family, but do you think you'd be where you are now if it had not been for sitar? I think I would definitely be in some sort of musical realm, you know, whether it be, I don't know, but I know that sitar has really pushed me to take it to that profession. You know, I think regardless, I still would do music, but it took me to a level of like professionalism and performance preparation and just interacting with, you know, an, an audience speaking, public speaking as well. And um, no, yeah, I don't think if it wasn't for my aunt, if it wasn't for sitar, I definitely don't think I would be where I am today. Like, I don't, maybe I wouldn't be talking to you guys today, but you That's know, right. I'm, I'm very thankful in that way too, you know, that I just graduated from a bachelor's degree, you know, and, you know, take great pride in that. And so, yeah, Sitar had a lot to do with that. Yeah, as, as, as that's great to hear. Thank you for yeah. sharing that. Um, and then I want to ask Nancy about what is the role uh, that the federal government um, is ensuring that we go back to school with arts education? Um, well, the Arts Endowment, and I'll put this link in the chat as well, the Arts Endowment has uh, created a, a whole back to school page uh, related to arts education. People can take a look at those resources. Um, you know, we don't have a federal mandate uh, in, in education in, in, the, in the way that our partners at the United States Department of Education have a federal mandate and all the state departments of education and local um, school districts. Um, so what we do is try to um, really support and enhance their efforts in arts education. And we do that through lots and lots of partnerships. Um, we work with the U.S. Department of Education to support uh, the arts education partnership. Uh, we've we've uh, co-funded and collaborated with that organization for 26 years and counting. Um, you mentioned the state arts agencies earlier. Um, the Arts Endowment supports all the state arts agencies in the 56 state and regional territories. So they're all working on this as well. Um, and they're, they're a mighty, the arts education staff at those agencies are a mighty, mighty bunch. They have a service org organization called the National Assembly of State Arts Agencies. There's another organization called the State Education Agencies, uh, uh, excuse me, State Education Agency Directors of Arts Education. It's kind of a mouthful. Um, so we're, we're, and we work with all the arts ed service organizations. We work with private philanthropists through the Grant Makers for Education organization. Um, uh, and we work with other federal agencies like the um, uh, Justice's um, Office of Juvenile Justice and Delinquency Prevention. So those are just, we just partner in so many ways and each of these organizations is working on this effort to, Help, help people may, retain, maintain, sustain, whatever word you want to use, and in, increase access to excellent arts education for all students across the country. Um, you know, this is a particularly difficult time, of course, with um, uh, the pandemic and the uncertainties uh, that that has brought, but I think the, the sparks of creativity are still there, and um, we want to do everything we can to um, improve opportunities for all children and youth and break down the, the equity gaps that, that are even more obvious uh, because of the pandemic. I hope that answers your question. Absolutely. Thank you so much. We have reached that point when we should switch to the Q&A. So I have more questions, but I will make that transition and start with the first question that I see from Chris Wingert. Sorry, Chris, you know, I know your last name. <laughs> he says, I have two big questions for this amazing group of panelists that I'm curious about as a musician, performer, and sitar board member. One, Os Oscar Hammerstein said, if you are a teacher, by your pupils, you will be taught. Is there a particular lesson a student patient taught you that comes to mind? I'll read the next question um, after a couple of you answer. If anybody wants to take that. Yeah. 
Well, I'll, I'll go ahead and then talk a little bit about, I mean, I think my patients teach me things every day. Um, I've learned a lot of patience from my patients in the sense of, you know, sometimes as a doctor, we try to like figure out, okay, let's hurry up and figure out what's going on so that way we can help. And sometimes, you know, you realize you have to just be patient and things unfold as they will unfold. And so I think one of the lessons, um, I have a particular patient that stood out and that, I mean, if you can imagine the crises that was around surrounding this child in their life, right? Related to trauma, related to the educational system. There was so much going on that the child had no control of. And, you know, I couldn't, I realized I can't control all those factors, right? I can't change all of that. And so the child, usually our inpatient stays are anywhere from about, you know, seven to 10 days. Um, And this child was with us for about 30 days. Uh Yeah. And I remember just every day trying to figure out what am I missing? What am I not doing right? And I think it was when I finally sat with it and I realized, you know, things will unfold how they will. You cannot, you know, rush this process. And so that patient would just talk with me and then every day you could start to see a subtle change. And so I think, you know, by the time that they left, um, they were much in a much better place. And, you know, three years later, they, they kind of circled back to me and told me they were graduating high school. They were working on their music. Um, but these were things that we had talked about during that month's day. And so I think one of the things I learned was sometimes you just have to sit and listen and things will unfold and, you know, pay attention and find the purpose in the small changes and the small shifts. Um, Because if you're so focused on the outcome and the end point, you're going to miss those things. And so I think, you know, think about that, whether it's with your patients, with your students, to find ways to acknowledge every small accomplishment, because every small accomplishment is what will build up to the bigger outcomes. And so I think that was a helpful experience for me as a, phys- as a physician to have learned. And how wonderful that they came back to let you know how well they were doing and they graduate. I'm sure that's not commonplace that people may think of you, but don't always reach back out. So that has to be something that will stay with you for a long time. So thank you for sharing that. Yeah. Oh, go uh, ahead, Ben. Yes. Also um, being a teacher, a cello teacher, you know, not teaching in a group setting necessarily and you know you do private lessons right um you have to learn how to teach each person differently you know not everybody has the same way of learning um not everybody likes the same type of music not everybody understands the rhythm before the melody part Mm -hmm. so there's a lot of parts that you know you have to as a teacher, be able to adapt and mold your lesson plans, your teaching strategies to each student. So yeah, so it's not one specific student, but it's you know what I've learned from teaching so many students. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And that is so important too, right? Like it's like a thumbprint. Everyone is a little bit different. Don't cook your right. cut creativity. Exactly. Thank you for sharing that. Yeah. Um, there is a second part to the question, and it says we are living. Oh, and I should remind everyone that um, not questions in the chat, but questions in the Q&A box. If you post them there, we will um, get to them. Um, the second part of Chris's question was, is we are living in a time full of unknown due to COVID and other extremely stressful realities. Do you think uh, what do you think are some of the potential barriers to help young people access the arts? Nancy, would you want to start with that? Do we just sure. That? Um, sure. And I would say, I just want to quickly say about that first question. So I don't get to work directly with students, but I have seen a lot of students in action. And I would just have to say, never underestimate what young people can do. They're really, it's just, Kind of, kind of mind blowing. Um, anyway, um, I would say uh, some you. of the barriers would be, um, you know, pushback from maybe schools who feel like we're in a time when we we have to really buckle down and 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 you know eliminate anything that seems extraneous. Like the, you know, some people think the arts are an extra when they're they're really 
you know, important as we have all been discussing. I think some of the uh, other barriers are, um, you know, lack of access to technology, to, um, you know, all the kinds of um, materials that you might need um, in, in, in various art forms. Um, but, you know, the technology gap that has been, it has been pretty big and lots of organizations are working to, to reduce those barriers. And, you know, um, it's been a real stressful time uh, for arts organizations as well. And, and a number have had to close their doors or really reduce staff. Um, you know, so I think, um, you know, the, that that can have a real trickle down in impact on um, what uh, arts organizations and schools can provide for students. So I think I think parents and students need to keep uh, demanding it and, and, and documenting and, and showing how important um, arts programs are for, for students for all the reasons that we've been discussing. Excellent, thank you. Would either of the other panelists like to respond to the question? Um, I would, I mean, I agree 100% with Nancy mentioned, and I would also say, you know, I think the exposure. And so, you know, there are some kids where they're in atmospheres where they're just not exposed to the concept that the arts could be something that's contrib that's that can be in their life. Um, you know, I think in our hospital, there are some kids, you know, they come to art group on the unit and they're like, what is this? And so they're just not exposed to it as much as they could be. So you don't know what you don't know. You don't know what can help you till you actually get exposed to it and see it, um, which is why I think it's so important that we find ways to integrate it um, into our children's lives. You know, I think there is this huge focus on academics, but I think what something that I've going back to the first question to, as well, something I've also learned is that while academics are important, you know, let's be honest, every kid is not going to, you know, find their place in academia. Like the, every, everyone is not so, I'm gonna be the top of my class, right? And so kids have to have other ways to master something, other ways to feel good about themselves, other talents that they can explore, right? That are just as equally important as getting A's in school is to do well and learn your musical talent and explore that to be able to develop, right? So I think we need to have a shift in how we look at what the arts means, that it's not adjunct, it's also a path for many kids that we need to make sure they're exposed to. Um, so I think that is some of the barriers is, is the way that our society at times views the arts as this kind of separate entity as opposed to a very possible path for many kids and many youth and how do we expose as many people to it because as I mentioned when we first met was that the arts can play a role in each child for a very different way whether it's developmentally whether it's for career purposes whether it's for just their mental health arts can play an integral approach an integral component of every child and they just they won't know that till they tap into it, of how it plays a role in their lives so it should be a part of something all kids get exposed to so I think that's part of the biggest barriers is just exposure Correct. And sometimes the genius in a child is through their art expression. Yep. Absolutely. So, yes, I agree. Thank you so much for that response. Um, any other questions in the chat? No, I don't see any other questions. So I do have, let's see here. Uh, Nancy, I had a question for you that I will um, ask, and that is, the arts can play a crucial role for students and educators, especially in addressing healing and trauma. Can you elaborate on that? Well, sure. And I think um, Dr. Tyson referred to that earlier in our conversation, and I'll just um, embellish a little bit and invite her to come back on, and Ben's as well, to, to answer the way they've seen this um, in, in their work. Um, but the, the arts provide an outlet uh, to process emotions, to explore and share personal and family and community stories and help develop empathy. They can be um, really important in creating mutual understanding. Um, they also um, uh, encourage creativity and collaboration, concentration, spontaneity. And um, these are all 
and these are all things that um, employers in the 21st century uh, that we're living in really seek and value in students. So um, as far as addressing healing and trauma, um, we've supported a number of projects and, and, and see really positive outcomes in all different um, arts disciplines. So students coming together to write a story about traumatic experiences that they've had. So the course of the last several years, a lot of that has been related to gun violence in schools or um, gun violence um, in other, other ways um, or um, uh, immigrant students um, moving to this country. Ben's, this might be your story a little bit, um, uh, working together on a theatrical production that talks about the immigrant experience. Um, uh, they're, just, they're just tons and tons and tons of projects that we've seen um, related to this. And I think, you know, it's just really important uh, to give even that outlet just for creative expression's sake that, that can help help with healing um, and sort of an, this is more of an adult example, but the Arts Endowment does support um, a really significant project um, uh, with uh, the, called the Arts in the Military. Um, and we had a presentation a while back from some of the people who um, were at Walter Reed who've been um, really struggling with PTSD related to their service. Um, in Iraq and Afghanistan, and, and um, there's a, there was a music program and a visual arts program in Clay. And one of the the guys who hadn't had really much of an arts education as a child was at Walter Reed, learning to play the guitar and play music. And um, he said that really the, the that the background noise in his head and the pain and the buzzing and you know however he described it when he played the guitar it went away. So, you know, it, it, we're learning at all stages of our lives and the, and the arts can help us at all stages of our lives and particularly in times of, of trauma. Yes, very true. Thank you. I think That's also going back to the previous question that Chris asked, um, which is the barrier, right? How do we overcome that? I think one of the barriers that I have witnessed is the power of representation and how impactful that can be on to some students, whether it be Latino like myself or black musicians. And, you know, lately there's been this whole movement or just awakening within the classical world, I know for sure, um, whether it be like through social media or just performances or just coming up with different repertoires to perform in recitals. But, you know, there are all these composers that have gone under, kind of like swept under the rug, like, um, but now we have like William Grant Still and we have Florence Price, all these African-American composers whose works are, are on the same level as Beethoven or Schubert or, you know, wow. but are finally now getting, you know, ex explored and performed, which I think is great. And now you have contemporary composers like Jesse Montgomery or um, Latino side, like Carlos Chavez, a lot of Mexican music as well, being performed in the classical world. So I think, you know, representation, not just as musicians, but also all this amazing archives of work to be performed and be heard by, you know, the youth is very important as well. So you think it's a bit better Right now, yeah. than it was. I do think. I mean, of course, it could be better. I think, Always. for example, from my applying to grad school right now, like one of the main, main something that just recently happened two years ago is part. This is for USC audition repertoire. Is you must perform a piece by a person of color, and that's it. Recently added to their you know audition requirements. So yeah, that's. Wow. I've seen it recently, you know, and so I think it's great. And but we need more of that, I think. Absolutely. Yeah. Very important. Thank you for bringing that up. Mm -hmm. um, I did want to ask uh, Dr. Tyson about um, how in the pandemic, um, you know, and you have an increased need and you have um, reduced capabilities. So um, what are some of the ways, are there any things you can tell us that you all are doing to make that 
to offset though that the, the conflict of greater interests and reduced um, capacity? Ooh, that's a that's a tough one because I think <laughs> I think you hit the the nail on the head as I think you know with with COVID as you know even mentioned just even with the arts there's been you know a decrease in what's available and so when you think about our mental health experience you know on the one hand you know our unit is usually 28 beds right um, but because of COVID protocols you know we we made the choice that we wanna keep the kids safe. So we stopped the double rooms. Mm -hmm. so then our capacity went down to 23. So we had to drop our capacity in order to make sure we were keeping everybody safe. Um, at the same time, we were having higher demand. So then we also ended up having kids stay longer because their needs were more severe. So our length of admission was kind of going up too. So it was, it's a, it's, a, it's a tricky dance that we've had to play. Um, I will say things that I have found that we've had to do more of other than longer work hours, unfortunately. Um, things that we've done that I do think have been helpful is we definitely do more family meetings because we realize, you know, in order for us to be able to transition a child out the hospital, we're gonna have to kind of be much more even even more intensive than we were being before. So we've had increased family meetings. We've had to, you know, with school being virtual most of last year, we had to find creative ways to get in touch with schools, to get in touch with teachers, to get the information. So we found ourselves, you know, stepping out of our box of, you know, you know, call the school and wait till they call them back to, oh, we're gonna call the school. We're gonna find an email address. We're gonna send an email to people. Right. We're gonna leave our email contact. So I think that line that used to be there of, you know, not per, not giving so much information to everybody, we kind of went against that and started, you know, giving all types of outpatient doctors and the um, teachers, like, here's my direct contact number, because I just need to reach you. And I know you're working from home. Here's my cell, call me too. So I think we had to practice in a little bit of a different way and be more flexible. Um, were some of the interventions we had to do. Um, we also had to do some more wellness initiatives for our providers because we know that we need to make sure, you know, some of the things that we hear and see um, from our kids are things that, you know, if we're not taking care of ourselves. It's hard to be there for them as well because we are still humans. So we've had to do, you know, the, the hospital has done more initiatives for the providers in the hospital so that way we can be at our best A game um, to help the kids on the unit. But it's, it's, it's been us working a little bit more on overdrive and being more creative and flexible um, to try to meet the needs of the, the kids while acknowledging that we have less resources and a higher demand. Um, and then also trying to be very mindful and strategic in how we connect kids with outpatient care and getting them the, the care that they need um, from the day they walk in the door, starting to work on that, just so that way we can make sure that we're not kind of waiting to the last minute because we know things aren't available. So there's a little bit of a transition that we had to do. Right. I was wondering how you all were handling that because I did read about reduced kids <laughs> and all that. Like, how are they doing it? Um, and I'd like to know, is I think it's probably to everyone's an advantage that you're having more meetings and more encounters with to move things along a lot faster because the need probably would warrant that regardless of whether you have the space or not. So that's really great to hear. So thank you for sharing that. Um, Maureen Dwyer, Executive Director of SITAR, has her hand up. So I turn to Maureen. Oh, thank you. I For some reason, I'm not able to do the Q&A from the panelists panel. So uh, okay. that's why I didn't type it. But first of all, I just want to thank the panelists for this really brilliant conversation and, and your insights. Um, and Ben's, Ben's comments really led me to think about the challenge our young people are facing, well, our nation is facing. Not only have we faced the pandemic um, in these last 15 to 18 months, we are really, the, the racial reckoning is at the surface in a, a way that um, can't be ignored. And at Sitar, most of our students are of color and have visceral experience of racism and the pain and the trauma that comes in that. So I'm wondering, in addition to the, the very important representation that Benz is talking with, if you all have thoughts about how the arts can play a role in helping people of any age, you know, we work primarily with youth, but um, recover and heal from the 
generational and uh, genetic changes that occur through, through racism and also um, advocate for themselves and have more agency through, through arts education and arts experience and how as we who provide arts education forums can be more aware and active in that role. Great question. It's an important topic too. Thank you, Maureen. You know, I mean, I, I was so happy when Ben's brought up the idea of representation because it's, you know, I think when we, you, you, Maureen, you made a comment related to kind of the intergenerational sequelae of racism. Um, and what you see is that over time, a group of individuals, they create a narrative for themselves, right? There's a narrative of what you can achieve, what you can achieve, what's your role in society. And so if you look at, if you're able to have increased representation and not just representation, but also celebration of that representation, right? So acknowledgement of these individuals on the same level as everyone else that's already been acknowledged, what you then do is you allow a child, a youth who is in the stages of creating their identity, of formulating who they wanna be, what they can do to create a different narrative because they see something different for themselves. And so when you, add in representation and celebration of that representation, you are essentially giving pathways to new narratives that a group or culture of people may not have been able to have because they've never seen it done before. They didn't know it was possible. They didn't know that there were boundaries that could be crossed to get to that point. And so I think what Benz is bringing up is so important. So if you can bring the arts and celebrate it and acknowledge these individuals, you are opening up pathways and doors that maybe many youth might not have even considered or thought could be a part of their own experience. And that's how you then stop this intergenerational negative narrative of where we stand in life and what we can achieve and do. Mm -hmm. I agree, thank you. That, that's a really great response. And I'll just add that, um, about 80% of the arts education grants that the arts endowment makes, and this is just kind of a slice of the pie across you know, the country, but about 80% of the, the funding dollars go toward um, what we euphemistically, euphemistically refer to as underserved communities. So underserved students could, uh, that could mean um, uh, economically underserved. It could mean uh, the project focuses on children and youth. It, they they may be in Title I schools uh, and or on the free and, you know, have predominantly on the free and reduced lunch program. Um, it could be LGBTQ plus students. Um, it could be students who um, have disabilities. It could be lots of things like that. And so we're, we're always looking through the equity lens and focusing on um, as much as we can on the children and youth who are the, at, at the most in, in need of the support through, through arts education programs. Thank you. Do we have any other questions? And if not, we are on perfect timing to wrap up the session. Um, so thank all of my panelists. I really appreciate your insightful, thoughtful feedback. There was so much that I'm like going through my notes, look for the highlights. I'm like, there's a lot of highlights. So I'll just try to go off memory the things that really stood out to me. Um, I think the, the video showing the children spoke to what we already know. And that is that children need to be together back in a place where they can see, feel, and, and, and experience life in real life. Um, the parents, I think, demonstrated the same type of joy um, where a National Endowment of the, for the Arts is concerned. Um, I thought, I, I remember that you had mentioned that 80% of the funding goes to underserved communities. I think that's an important thing to remember and that you all are doing a lot of work to help people who may not know to turn to arts, may not have had the exposure to arts yet, that they may tap into some of the services that you're offering on a national level. So I appreciate that. Uh, uh, Dr. Tyson, I think you shared really valuable information that you know we probably all need some kind of uh, back-end mental health care that we aren't even able to identify at this point because this is all still so new. But I appreciate the direction and the information that you gave about taking note of signs that you may see 
um, and ways to try to help our children to be um, more whole and to get the help that they need and that you all at the hospital are able to handle that. So that's amazing. Thank you so much. Um, and Ben, uh, your experience and your sharing and learning more about you today just really was over the top. Thank you for sharing so much about who you are and how you came to be where you are. And um, the children of California are certainly lucky to have your experience, your empathy, and your willingness to help bring them along. You know, you're paying it forward. And I think that's a really important thing to do. Um, and there are many other things that were brought up today, but I think, um, I think we've covered a lot. I think those highlights are the things that stand out the most to me. I want to say thank you to everyone and to remind everyone that Sitar Arts Center is a place that we welcome all. And now you are all, whether you've been with us before or not, a part of the family. And once you come in, we want you to stay in. So if you have some kind of volunteer work that you'd like to contribute to Sitar, we welcome that. If there is anything that you think you can do to help Sitar, we welcome it. We at Sitar are a strong group of people who are all committed to making the lives of those children more fulfilling um, because we know the value of what that does for them in their future. So um, thank you all. And I hope that we will see you again, whether it's your first or hundredth time with us. And to everyone, I wish you all a good night. Thank you.